September 11th, 2025, Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. A Hughes 3-6-9-D helicopter goes down while performing power line work. Tragically, both men on board, pilot Jeffrey Patmore, 52, from Terrace, British Columbia, and line technician Michael Higgins, 40, from Haddon Township, New Jersey, lost their lives. Now, the NTSB has released its preliminary report, and while it doesn't give us final answers, it does give us a lot to unpack. And here's the thing. This wasn't just any ordinary flight. This was a highly specialized, extremely risky kind of mission. So the real question we need to dig into is, what exactly happened up there, and what bigger lessons can we pull from this type of operation? Let's start with what this helicopter was actually doing, because it's not something most people ever see. This was a Part 133 external load operation. In plain English, that means the helicopter wasn't just flying from point A to point B, it was being used like an airborne work truck. Under Part 133, pilots and crews handle everything from carrying suspended loads to lifting utility workers into hard-to-reach spots. And in this case, the helicopter was tasked with a very niche but important job marking a fiber optic ground wire, or OPGW, above the main transmission lines. Now what is OPGW? Think of it as a combo cable. It acts like a lightning shield while also carrying fiber optics for communications. Pretty clever design, but it comes with its own maintenance challenges. Crews needed to mark precise spots along that cable so that later on they could install anti-galloping dampers. And galloping, by the way, is not some fun cowboy term. It's when strong winds, or ice, cause power lines to oscillate wildly. It can snap lines, damage towers, and cause massive outages. So putting in dampers at the right spots is a big deal. To get this done, the line technician, Michael Higgins, was literally positioned outside on the helicopter's skid plate, taping markers directly onto the wire. Just picture that. Standing on the skid, with rotor wash blasting around, while the helicopter hovers right next to a 120-foot tower and live transmission lines. That's not just risky, that's one of the most unforgiving environments you can put a helicopter into. And it speaks to how critical and high stakes this mission was. Utilities rely on this kind of work to keep the grid reliable. But it also means the margin for error is razor thin. Now let's get into what we know about the crash itself. According to the NTSB prelim, the helicopter took off around 2 p.m. with about 45 gallons of jet A fuel on board. Barely two minutes later, at about 2.02 p.m., it crashed near a 120-foot transmission tower. That's how fast everything unfolded. And here's something really interesting. While no one actually saw the accident happen, other crews working about two miles away reported feeling vibrations running through the power lines at almost the exact same time. That little detail might end up being hugely important in figuring out what went wrong. When investigators got to the site, they found the wreckage in a nose-down, vertical impact position. Right next to it, a severed section of the fiber optic wire. That strongly suggests the helicopter either made contact with the line, or the line snapped during the accident sequence. The damage pattern backs up the idea of a violent, high-energy impact. Four of the five main rotor blades were completely separated from the hub. One blade was still attached, but curled around the wreckage like tinfoil. The tail boom and stabilizers were broken off, scattered behind the main wreckage. The fuel tank was ruptured. Jet A spilled all over the ground. But surprisingly, there was no post-crash fire. Put all of that together, and it paints a picture of a helicopter that lost control in extremely close quarters with those wires. Whether it was direct contact, a sudden upset, or a loss of clearance margin, what we're looking at is a catastrophic breakup in flight followed by an almost vertical nose-down impact, and it happened in seconds. That's the scary part. In this type of power line work, there's often no time to recover once something goes wrong. When you look at the human side of this accident, one thing stands out immediately. Experience was not the problem here. The pilot, Jeffrey Patmore, had logged over 11,700 flight hours 
with more than 2,600 of those in the exact Hughes 369D model. That's a massive amount of time in the air, especially in such a specialized helicopter. He also held a current commercial rotorcraft certificate and a valid second-class medical, so regulatory-wise, he was fully qualified. This wasn't someone new to the job. He was extremely seasoned. The aircraft itself wasn't fresh off the factory line. It was a 1981 Hughes 369D powered by an Allison 250C 20 R2 turbine producing about 450 shaft horsepower. But don't let the age fool you. Helicopters like this can fly for decades if they're maintained properly. And in this case, the maintenance records show it was under a manufacturer-approved inspection program. The most recent 100-hour inspection was completed just a few months earlier, in June 2025, and the helicopter had only about 78 hours of flight since then. That tells us this machine was being kept in check, at least on paper. And then there's the operator, Winko Powerline Services. These guys specialize in exactly this type of work, helicopter-assisted powerline operations. This wasn't some outfit dabbling in high-risk jobs without the expertise. So the really frustrating part here is that we're talking about an experienced pilot, a properly maintained aircraft, and a company that knows this field inside out. And yet, tragedy still struck. This is where we get into the truly unforgiving nature of powerline work. Wire strikes are one of the leading causes of fatal helicopter accidents worldwide. They're insidious because wires are thin, hard to see, and often blend right into the background. Now yes, there are systems like Wire Strike Protection Systems, WSPS, basically hardened cutters on the helicopter that can slice a wire if you hit it at the right angle and speed. But here's the truth. WSPS doesn't make you invincible. It's designed mainly for forward flight, not for low speed, close in work, like hovering near a transmission tower. In the environment November 5072 Foxtrot was flying in, a WSPS would likely offer little to no help. On top of that, this wasn't just normal flying, this was external load work involving human external cargo, or heck. Under FAA Part 133, there are strict rules and safety practices laid out in advisory circulars like AC 133-1B. Those cover things like crew training, communication procedures, and abort criteria. But here's the kicker. When you've got a technician literally standing on the skid, the risks skyrocket compared to long line operations. With long line, the worker is far below the helicopter. On the skid, everything is happening right next to the rotors, towers, and wires. The margin for error is almost non-existent. And that detail about crews two miles away feeling vibrations in the line at the time of the accident? That's not trivial. It suggests the helicopter physically interacted with the span, and those vibrations traveled down the wire. Combine that with the wreckage showing a severed fiber optic cable, and you start to see just how dangerous this environment is. Sadly, this isn't the first time a Hughes 369D has been lost in powerline work. There have been past accidents in similar contexts, sometimes due to wire contact, sometimes due to workload, and planning factors. We're not drawing a direct line between those cases and this one, but history does show that working close to energized infrastructure is one of the most unforgiving jobs in aviation. So, where does the investigation go from here? The NTSB is going to dig into several angles. First, they'll look for wire contact evidence, transfer marks, scratches on rotor blades, or damage patterns on the severed fiber optic line that could confirm whether contact happened before the crash. They'll also analyze the rotor and tail systems to determine whether components failed before impact or if they were torn apart during the crash sequence. This matters because it helps investigators separate cause from effect. Another critical piece will be pilot decision-making. That doesn't mean fault. It means understanding how clearance margins, approach paths, and task workload were managed. When you're trying to hold a helicopter rock solid next to a tower, while your technician works on the skid, you're at max workload. Even a slight distraction or unexpected gust can become catastrophic. Finally, investigators will review operator procedures. Did the company have clear abort criteria? 
if things started to go wrong? Were communication protocols solid between the pilot and the technician? Did the crew have escape routes planned? These questions matter because in power line work, the difference between safe and unsafe is often about how well the risks are mitigated before the helicopter even takes off. And if there's one lesson here, it's this. Working in close proximity to wires leaves almost zero room for recovery if contact is made. That's not about blaming anyone. It's about recognizing how brutal the margins are in this line of work. The takeaway is risk mitigation, planning, procedures, and knowing when to step back. At the end of the day, this accident took the lives of Jeffrey Patmore and Michael Higgins, two professionals doing vital work. The NTSB final report will take time, but for now, the best we can do is learn from what's been shared so far. Stay tuned, subscribe, and join me as we follow this investigation and discuss what it means for aviation safety going forward.